Okay, great. So <clears throat> good afternoon and welcome to our Tribal Youth Diversion Grant Bidders Conference. Um, I am gonna switch this real fast. So this is just a quick look at the plan for, um, for today's presentation. So we'll start out with some introductions and then we'll take a uh, pretty high level look at the grant and some of the key features there and then talk a little bit about the executive steering committee and then spend more time looking at the RFP and doing a little bit of an overview for both the RFP and the budget attachment. We'll then talk about the proposal rating process and uh, go over proposal instructions and key dates and then wrap it up with a uh, Q&A session. Okay, so just starting out, I am Kimberly Bouchard. I'm the lead field rep for the Tribal Youth Diversion Grant and I will ask my colleagues to introduce themselves as well. Hello, my name is Elise Ram. I work in the research division here at the BSCC. Um, my main uh, job with designing the RFP and the grant itself was to help with the rating factors and the criteria that you'll be including in any proposals that are submitted. Hi, I'm Isabel Diaz. I'm the analyst on the Tribal Youth Diversion Program and the Youth Reinvestment Grant. Hello, my name is Juanita Renaga. I'm the Senior Management Auditor with the BSCC. Hi, my name is Greg Donkerbrook. I'm a manager here at the BSCC. I oversee Isabel and help with the program. Um, and can we ask you to introduce yourself as well? Great. Okay. Thank you for making the drive today. Um, okay. So then if you want to switch that order, Sean, so folks can see... Um, actually, I, I'm sorry, before we do that, I wanted to um, check in for, I think we do have some folks joining us via live stream. So I just wanted to check in real quickly and ask that you please send us a quick um, note uh, to introduce yourselves just so that we know who's joining us. Um, and also to make sure that you're hearing us and seeing us okay, that'd be very helpful. Um, all right, and then uh, before we move on, did just wanna quickly remind everyone the purpose of the bidders conference is to review the uh, request for proposals to provide any clarity that may be needed in terms of the instructions for the RFP and to respond to technical questions. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and get started on looking a little bit at this grant and what is provided. So the Tribal Youth Diversion Grant was uh, first implemented last year and it was originally part of the Youth Reinvestment Grant. So for the 2018 version of this grant, there was 1.1 million available that was a set aside from the Youth Reinvestment Grant, and those funds were fully expended in support of two tribes that uh, were successful in the proposal process. So for this year, 2019, we're looking at the Tribal Youth Diversion as a standalone program uh, with a total of 9.7 million in funding for new grants. So very excited to be able to offer additional funding this year. The focus for the grant remains the same. It is intended to provide diversion programs for Indian children who are under the age of 18. And it is required by the legislation that the interventions funded through this grant be trauma-informed, community-based, and health-based in nature. When the executive steering committee looked at that language, the trauma-informed, community-based, and health-based, um, they felt that it was important for the purposes of this tribal grant to, to get a little bit more specific in a couple different ways. And we see that in terms of um, the definition around trauma-informed 
and specifically for this grant, it is imperative that trauma-informed diversion services uh, funded through tribal youth diversion be sensitive to the issues of historical trauma. And then similarly, the health-based approaches funded under this grant must be grounded in an overall wellness approach. Then just looking uh, briefly at the executive steering committee, our executive steering committees are always chaired by one of our BSCC board members, and in this case, Michael Ertola from Nevada County. Um, he's the chief probation officer there, was selected as the chair, and he was joined by four other members with tribal and other expertise to uh, comprise the executive steering committee. So the function of the executive steering committee is first to develop the criteria and help us put together the RFP. And then as the process unfolds, those same uh, five individuals will be responsible for reading and rating the proposals and ultimately for developing the award recommendations. So <clears throat> as a result of the work that they do that drives not only how this grant is developed, who's eligible to apply, and how that's shaped, um, and, and also very involved in developing the recommendation for who ultimately receives this funding, uh, we have pretty strict conflict of interest policies so that anyone who's involved in the executive steering committee is uh, prohibited from receiving funds. So that includes either the individuals personally receiving funds. It also includes um, individual, or I'm sorry, organizations that the individual ESC members work for from receiving funds through this grant. And then I just also wanted to note that there's also a, an implication here for the community-based organizations that could be involved as service providers under this grant. So again, with anyone who's a subcontractor or a subgrantee, sub we would also be looking uh, for conflict of interest and that would be prohibited. All right. So <clears throat> from here and for the next um, mini slides, we will be looking at what's specifically included in the RFP and walking through um, in a pretty methodical way the key provisions of this RFP. So before we jump into that, I just want to check with my colleagues. No questions or anything coming in? Okay, very good. We will move forward then. So um, Starting out on page one of the RFP, just some general information there. And again, we do have 9.7 million available in funding for this 2019 version of the Tribal Youth Diversion Grant. Um, once again, this year, only federally recognized tribes are eligible to apply. And the applications should lay out a proposal for providing diversion options that target Indian children who are under 18 and who are facing entry to the juvenile justice system or further involvement in that system. In general, the RFP is designed to allow broad flexibility around the types of diversion and the points of entry. So when the executive steering committee talked about this, it was really their interest to allow enough flexibility within this RFP so that applicants could come in and really tell their story and put together a proposal that uh, was, was specific to their unique needs and that provided um, a proposal to address those needs. Looking at some of the specifics here, we see that the first thing, or I should say the next thing um, that's coming up are letters of intent. So we are asking for prospective applicants to submit letters of intent to us by December 20th. Um, I know that's a short turnaround. Um, I was hoping to get them in before the holidays. Um, 
But just a few notes here. One, these letters are non-binding. So if an applicant or a prospective applicant submits a letter of intent and later decides not to apply, there is in no way any penalty for that. And then um, on the flip side, if applicants um, um, don't submit the letter and decide later, of course, they're still welcome to submit the proposal. Um, okay, the other thing I really want to stress here is that it is so very helpful to us to receive letters of intent so that we can know what to expect. So even if you can't make that December 20th uh, due date, please, please, please go ahead and send those letters into us so that we do know that you're anticipating applying for these funds. Okay. And then the proposals themselves will be due on February 21st of next year. And <clears throat> we are following a different um, a different uh, path this year for those who may have applied last year. Um, so we are only accepting electronic versions of the proposal package this year. So we have a dedicated mailbox that we've created for this grant. It's Tribal Youth Diversion at bscc.ca.gov. And we are only going to be accepting electronic copies of the application packet that are submitted to that mailbox by 5 p.m. on February 21st. Um, I, maybe it's already clear, but just to emphasize that a little bit more, we, we will not accept hard copies. So for any applicant that we receive a hard copy but do not receive the required electronic copy, that proposal will not go forward. Okay, and then moving on in the RFP, I'm now at page three for anyone who might be following along. Um, and Sonia, I just there were some handouts on the back table if you're interested in grab. Uh, thank you, Greg. Sorry, I didn't think to point that out earlier. Okay, okay, good. Um, okay, so then looking just a little bit more closely at the eligible applicants. Again, it is only federally recognized Indian tribes in California that are uh, able to apply and receive these funds. But there was a uh, provision in the law that I wanted to talk about for just a minute here. And so in the, in the law, it talks about funding priority be gi being given to um, those places where they're experiencing high rates of juvenile arrests, high rates of suicide, high rates of alcohol and substance abuse, and lower than average high school graduation rates. So this is something that the ESC looked at and talked about, and the decision was made that um, the data supports the notion that any of these tribes that would be applying for these funds are in fact experiencing these uh, high rates or the low graduation rate. So a presumption is built into the RFP that every federally recognized tribe in California does in fact meet this criteria and is therefore eligible to apply. So there's no need for any individual applicant to demonstrate that they are experiencing these rates. That presumption is already there. Okay. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about multiple applications. So this is a new feature that was not part of the RFP last year. And um, I wanna make sure we go over this in some detail because it seems like it could be potentially a little confusing. So what the ESC wanted to allow for 
is that every applicant may submit up to two applications. And then there's four categories within which those two applications could potentially fall. So there's an individual application. Um, someone could also be part of an application as a partner on someone else's individual application. Um, it's possible for a tribe to be the lead of a regional application, and then it's also possible to, for them to be a co-applicant within a regional application where a different tribe is serving as the lead. Okay, so again, four options for up to two total applications. All right, so then let's look at the project funding information for this grant. We have a total of three and a half years for these uh, grants. So for those who are successful in the process and uh, identified to receive this funding, we do plan to begin the new grants on July 1st of next year and then they would run through December 31st of 2023. Uh, once again, there's a total of 9.7 million available. And in this case, the ESC adopted two different funding categories that applications will fall into. Those funding categories are urban and rural. So on the applicant information form that's at the very back part of the RFP, um, you'll see at the very top, there's a place for each applicant to identify whether they are urban or rural. And it is critical that that part of the applicant information form be completed. So in looking at the request amounts for any individual application, the maximum request amount is 1.4 million. And then um, for regional requests, a couple things I wanna say about regional requests. First of all, the amount requested can be multiplied by the number of federally recognized tribes who are formally a part of a given region. So if you have a region that includes two federally recognized tribes, your maximum request amount would be 2.8 million. Um, and there is no maximum in terms of the number of tribes that could be a part of a regional request, but it is necessary that each party, each tribe be federally recognized uh, to be part of that region and to increase the dollar amount that's allowable. And then the other thing about regional requests is that the ESC did uh, feel that this is an important component and something that they were interested in encouraging. So they did um, provide for preference points to be awarded to any regional applicants. We'll look at that a little bit more specifically in a few minutes. Um, okay, for this grant, there's no match required. And I also wanted to note that supplanting of funds is not allowed. The BSCC has some pretty specific requirements related to non-governmental organizations that uh, receive our grant funds. So although the applicants in this case will be tribes, we uh, anticipate that there may be uh, instances where the tribes enter into a subcontract with one or more non-governmental organizations or community-based organizations in order to actually provide the services that will be delivered to young people under this grant. So when we look at those um, non-governmental organizations that would receive in an indirect way the tribal youth diversion grant funds, it's important that these criteria all be considered. And so just quickly here, 
um, any NGO or CBO that receives these funds must be duly organized in existence and in good standing for at least six months. And that six month period would begin on the date um, that you enter into a contractual agreement with them. So then from that date, you're gonna back up six months and that tells you when they would have had to be um, established and in good standing. And then it's also imperative that the NGOs be registered with the California Secretary of State's office, if applicable, and that they have a valid business license if required by the local jurisdiction. They would also need to have any other licenses or certifications necessary to provide the services that they are being put under contract to provide. And then lastly, it is necessary that they have an address. Um, for the Tribal Youth Diversion Grant, it's not imperative that it be a physical address, but we do need to have an address. Okay, the Executive Steering Committee did build in some evaluation requirements to this grant. So that's reflected here um, in the local evaluation plan and the local evaluation report. So how this works is that each um, applicant that's selected to receive these funds will be asked to develop a local evaluation plan at the very beginning of the contractual period. So, um, so we'll provide some additional guidance and some time for each of the grantees to put together a plan that will include identifying goals and objectives and will lay out the methodology to be used to assess the effectiveness of the funded project. And then at the very end of the contract term, we'll be looking for a local evaluation report. So as you conclude your project, we'll be um, asking you to take a look at how successful that project was overall in terms of meeting your goals. All right, so on pages eight and nine of the RFP, there is a box, there is a big stop sign, <laughs> and I really wanna make sure we spend some time here talking about this because this is really important. Um, this is something new for the BSCC, and that's why I'm particularly taking time to draw attention to it. Um, we have consistently undertaken a technical review process. So when we receive applications, we spend some time going through them and, um, and looking for compliance with the provisions that are laid out in the RFP. But uh, beginning with this grant and the YRG um, RFP that also just recently came out, we have included some pretty um, specific disqualification instructions. So we're not going to be taking technical, t <coughs> sorry, technical corrections in the same way that we have in the past. And so it's more important than ever that you make sure you're familiar with the requirements that are included in the RFP and in particular, I would encourage everyone to rely heavily on the checklist that's included at page 83, which um, I just wanna note that page 83 doesn't actually have a page number, <laughs> but if the page numbers continued, I think it leaves off at 81, if the page numbers continued, it would be page 83. Um, so again, really, really take some time to study that information that's on pages eight and nine in terms of what would cause an application to be disqualified. And then also, as you finalize your application, make sure you go through that checklist and ensure that each item is included 
is complete, is signed where needed, and that all of the components are there. Okay, so then moving along in the RFP, we are at pages 11 and 12 here. And um, there are a number of different requirements that are, um, that are spelled out here and described in, in fairly good detail. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on any of these, but I do wanna go, th go over them at least briefly. So the grant agreement, for those who are selected for funding, the grant agreement will be the uh, formal contractual um, document that will be completed to solidify your grant award and the nature of your agreement with us should you receive funding. Um, Part of that and uh, something that we will need to receive before we can finalize the grant agreement will be the governing board or tribal council resolution. Um, and then the audit requirements. We do retain the ability to audit this grant at any time during the course of the grant or for three years following conclusion of the grant term. Uh, we will be providing a grantee orientation. So once the funding award decision has been made and all the grantees have been notified, um, and hopefully once we've started the process of getting those who will be funded under contract, we will conduct a grantee orientation to go over in more detail the um, responsibilities of each grantee and how our relationship will work through the course of your grant funding. Uh, okay, so funding disbursement for this grant. We are able to offer advance payment of one third of the total grant award. So once we have a grant agreement in place that is signed by everyone and, um, and uh, recorded by the state controller's office, then we will be able to accept a payment request and process the first payment. And then from there, the additional payments will be made as um, the grant funds are spent down. So we would do, once 80% is, is spent of the first payment, then we would be able to offer the second payment and then the same thing for the final payment. Once 80% is spent, we would offer the final payment. Okay, a few other requirements to cover here, and now we're at pages 12 through 14. The quarterly progress reports. Every grantee will be asked to complete quarterly progress reports, and there's a sample provided in the RFP that I think uh, will we'll give you a pretty close proxy for what will actually be used once the grants are in place. Um, without a doubt, there will be some changes at least, but I do think that's probably pretty close to what it'll look like. Um, travel, travel is allowed to be billed through this grant, um, though there some, are some specific requirements, so I encourage you to read through that. And then, sorry, um, we do ask that each grantee sign a certification relative to debarment, fraud, theft, and embezzlement. So the idea here is that we want to be doing business with reputable entities and taking some precaution um, up front to ensure that that happens. Compliance monitoring visits are something that we conduct um, on a periodic but regular basis. And so also in the RFP, there's a sample compliance monitoring tool. So again, like the quarterly progress report, that may change a little bit, but if you look through that, that'll give you a pretty good idea of how we will be looking at your program over time. 
and what our expectations are in terms of implementation for the grant projects. Okay, and then there is a, um, some information on both effective programs and data-driven approaches um, included in the RFP, and we do want you to take a look at that, and of course we always encourage the implementation of effective programs wherever possible. All right, so we are going to move into a little bit different segment here. So I'm gonna pause for a minute and ask if there are any questions, nothing online, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oops, hold on, let us get you on the mic, thanks. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, just uh, harping back a little bit to the discussion on the NGOs and partners yes. um, versus regions and individuals. Um, what if um, a tribe wants to work with a county or a city? Um, uh, any differences in what you need or what you want to see for that? They they wouldn't be so we have a um, we have a specific form a certification form for those NGOs. So you wouldn't need to use that form. Mm -hmm. um, we would just be looking for you to use whatever your normal contracting practice is. Mm -hmm. So to follow the same rules that you follow normally as part of your business. Yeah, sure. And actually I should add, um, the provisions that we the contracting provisions that we hold you to, we also ask that you um, maintain that same expectation for your sub-grantees or subcontractors. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Sure. All right, so then with this next slide, we move into the next part of the process. So up until now, we've been looking at the RFP and looking at uh, the application process. But once applications are submitted to us, we move into a different phase, and, um, and that's all about the proposal rating. So again, just as a reminder, we are looking for electronic submissions of the applications this time. Um, and I just want to let everyone know, so no one's surprised by this, you will receive an auto notification. So when you do your electronic submission of your application, you're gonna get a system generated response saying that we have received it. So um, um, don't get thrown off by, by not receiving a personal message back or um, something like that. If you wanna reach out to us to confirm, of course you can always do that, but um, Generally speaking, the process just provides for that auto reply. Um, again, here, I just want to remind you again about the disqualification instructions and to pay careful attention to that. Um, and then the ESC rating process. So when we, when we receive the applications, like I talked about a minute ago, um, we'll take a look at all of them, look for the disqualification um, um, information, see if anything <coughs> is going to be disqualified. But then for all of those proposals we receive um, that are ready to move forward, they will go to our ESC members and the ESC members are then responsible for reading and rating the proposals. So we'll look a little bit at how that happens. So as part of the RFP development process, and you can see this table that's on the slide, if you go to page nine of the RFP, and with this, the ESC members did decide on the rating factors that would be included for this grant, and they are project need, project description, data collection and evaluation, and then project budget. So there's some really good information here on this page. You see here all the different categories that you're going to need to address when you put together your proposal. 
And um, in particular, I would encourage you to take a look at the percent of total value that's listed here. So as um, these things often go, there is a limited number of pages that are allowed for your proposal. And as you think about how to prioritize the information that you present and how much detail to provide for different components, um, you might find it helpful to refer back to that percent of total value. All right, so then um, on the last slide, we saw that for each of the rating factors that will be used here, there is a point value that varies from one to five. So now we see on this slide the one to five scale that is used with one being poor and five being excellent. And so I do just wanna note here that there is no zero, so it's one to five. And so um, in order to be funded, um, any, any proposal that is going to receive these funds has to receive a total score of, or, or I'm sorry, a total percentage of points they ha of 60%. So, i sorry, I said that really awkwardly. Um, but of the total points available, an applicant has to receive at least 60% of the available points in order to be funded for this grant. So then when you look at the scoring rubric that's in front of us in the one to five scale, that means um, you're going to need a satisfactory rating. And then again, just a little bit more information here on the preference points that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So there's the um, points that are available from the rating factors that we just looked at. And those, all, those, will, those points will be assigned as the, um, the ESC members who are the raters go through your proposal. But then there's also a possibility of receiving up to five, or I'm sorry, not up to, of receiving five preference points on top of the score that's received from the rating factors. And those preference points would be awarded for a uh, regional application. So again, with a regional application, a federally recognized tribe has to be identified as the lead, and then the region has to be comprised of at least two federally recognized neighboring tribes. And in order to receive the preference points, it will be required that each of the tribes that are making up the region submit a letter, and that letter needs to spell out the the tribe's commitment to the project, as well as identify the tribe's roles and responsibilities relative to the project. And then in addition, um, the uh, regional application would have to meet all of the RFP requirements that pertain to regional applications. Okay, so are there any questions on that piece of it? Just a quick question. Sure. Is, there, is there a definition for neighboring tribes? There is not a definition. Are there any questions online? No? Okay. Do we, how many people do we have? Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and 
Um, I just want to look here at the proposal components. So this is just an overall look at what you will be putting together if you are going to apply for this grant. So <clears throat> the first thing is a proposal abstract, and that is limited to one page. And then we have the proposal narrative, which is limited to 12 pages. Um, and that proposal narrative will include your project need, your project description, and also your data collection and evaluation component. So um, you also need to complete a project work plan, but that isn't included in the 12 pages. It's a separate form, and it's the very last page of the RFP. And then you'll also have your project budget um, that also is not part of the 12 pages and is a separate document. In the case of the budget, it's in an Excel document, and um, we're going to turn to Isabel in just a few minutes here, and she will walk us through that with considerably more detail. Um, and then there's also additional documents for this grant, and you can uh, provide up to five pages of additional documents. And that could include letters of commitment from other um, individuals, like you talked about perhaps working with a government agency. Could be a letter of commitment from them or from another community partner or partner that would be part of the project. Um, it could also be supporting documentation. So things like charts, graphs, data tables, uh, even bibliographies, to the extent that they're cited in your proposal narrative and the supporting documentation is in direct support of information that's provided in your proposal narrative, that would also be allowed. Okay, so Sean, we're at the point where we're ready to switch over to the budget. Um, any questions before we move into that? Nope, okay, good. So. Okay, as Kim mentioned, I'll be covering the budget attachment. Um, we'll go over where to locate your budget attachment, um, how to fill it out, and then we'll also cover a few examples. So to locate your budget attachment, you can go to the Tribal Youth Diversion website. The link is on this page here. Uh, you'd click on the first accordion. Within the body of the accordion, you'll find the uh, Tribal Youth Diversion RFP hyperlink. Once you select that link, uh, it'll lead you to the RFP. And on pages either 21 or 87, you can find the link to the budget attachment. As Kim mentioned earlier, it's a separate Excel document. So when you open it up, you'll see two tabs. The first tab will be the um, invoice, I'm sorry, the budget instructions. And then the second tab will be the actual budget table and budget narrative. So taking a closer look at the budget attachment, the first section that you see is this blue table. It's the budget line items that each applicant is um, limited to. And each, I'm sorry, so yes, this area here that's um, shaded blue is locked and it auto-populates based off information you'll enter for budget line items one through nine. We'll go over that on the next slide. So here I have an example of data collection, what the budget table and budget narrative look like. So the on the previous slide, those nine line items that we had on the screen, um, each line item would have their individual budget table and budget narrative. In the budget table, you'll enter your expenditures followed by the description in the narrative section. So a few things I would like to mention about the budget attachment are um, at the very top of the attachment, you'll um, enter the tribe name. Your budget attachment will be the budget for the entire grant term. Your funds should be requested in whole dollars, and if you are not requesting funding out of a particular line item, 
go ahead and indicate this by just entering a zero dollar and an NA in the narrative section. So here are a couple examples for salary and benefits that you could reference when you are filling out your budget. In this section here, you would just identify the staff that would be um, funded through the grant. NGO subcontracts. In this section here, you would identify any subcontracts that you may have throughout the grant term. Um, at the time of submission, if you do not have any identified, we just ask that you identify the allocation amount and the services that will be provided by the subcontractors. Equipment and fixed assets. Um, equipment and fixed assets are non-expendable property having a useful life of more than one year and acquisition cost of 5000 or more per unit. So the example I have here is a vehicle. So even though you submit a proposal and you identify you plan to purchase the vehicle and you're awarded funding, we would still request that you um, receive prior approval before actually purchasing this vehicle. In the other line item, you would identify training or travel. And similar to um, equipment, if you are going to, um, well, actually, out-of-state travel is restricted and only allowed in um, exceptional situations. And again, you would have to request prior approval even if it's identified in your proposed budget. Indirect costs. So applicants have either two options. So you can go with option one, which is 10% of direct salaries and wages, including or excluding benefits, or option two, 5% of total direct project costs, excluding equipment. And in the narrative section, we just ask that you identify the expenses that will be supported by the indirect cost rate. Any questions? I felt like oh. I went through that really fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> my contact information and also the um, travel you diversion in case any questions come up in the future. All right, so now we will switch back over. There we are, awesome. Oops, that's okay. Whew. All right, excellent. Okay, so just um, <clears throat> a few little reminders here on the budget table, or the budget <coughs> attachment that Isabel just walked through. It does include both the budget table and the narrative. And just a reminder that they're both really important. We need good information that ties clearly to the uh, written narrative in both of those um, places. And then also a note about the, the amount. So <clears throat> when you submit your application, you'll be requesting uh, for an individual application up to 1.4 million, and that is for the total term of the grant. So when you complete your budget, it needs to tie to that total request amount, and that should um, spell out for us how you'll be spending funds over that whole three and a half year period. Um, again, the link to the budget attachment is built directly into the RFP, so as Isabel uh, mentioned there's a couple places in there where you can go to link directly to that Excel document. And then lastly, just a request here to please not um, uh, get into our form and change formulas or delete formulas and move things around. It really makes it very challenging for us um, to do our review and <coughs> um, compilation on the back end. So if you would please just uh, work with us on that, we would greatly appreciate it. Okay, so as you may have noticed in this very lengthy document that is the RFP, there are a whole bunch of attachments 
And <clears throat> I just want to go through this list um, uh, quickly, fairly quickly, to make sure that you know what you have in front of you here. So for this grant, the, the first attachment, Appendix A, is a list of the eligible tribes. So these are the federally recognized tribes in California. And again, to be an applicant for this grant, you do need to be on that list. And then the next three appendices, B, C, and D, are all things, they're in red here because these are um, documents that you need to fill out and submit to us and that need signatures. So I try to group those together in the order and uh, to highlight them in red here. So the first, again, is that, that NGO criteria that we talked about, and we do ask that you complete that. At the time of your application, if you don't, don't know of any NGOs that you'll be working with, we still ask that you fill it out and sign it. Um, and that just gives us your acknowledgement that you understand the criteria. Uh, for Appendix C there, again, that's just our, our um, way of making sure that we are um, not taking any undue risks in terms of safeguarding these grant funds against fraud or other inappropriate behavior. Um, and then Appendix D is a sample of the resolution. You do not have to use our form. You can use your own as long as it has the information that's requested. <coughs> and then Appendix E is a glossary, and that does have some definitions that are specific to this grant, so we encourage you to take a look through the glossary. And then Appendix F provides some information about the local evaluation plan and specifically what we would be looking for as you complete that plan, which does come due fairly soon after applicants are selected for funding. Um, all right, and then moving on to Appendix G. So this kind of ties back to the disqualification instructions and um, gives you something that you can use, and this is what we will use when the proposals come in. We look at this and compare your application to this to make sure that you have the right font, the right margins, and so on. And so we're just providing it to you here as a tool, and um, hopefully it is helpful. Appendix H is the ESC roster. So remember that we talked earlier about those ESC members and specifically about the conflict of interest policy of the BSCC. So as you think about how you're gonna put your grant together and who you might partner with, it's important for you to be aware of these individuals who did serve a role in developing the grant and will be involved in um, rating the proposals. Appendix I is a sample of the standard agreement. So this will give you a good idea of what you would be asked to sign in terms of your agreement with us should you be selected for funding. And then Appendix J is a sample of the quarterly progress report. And again, this may change a little bit um, in terms of the final version that will be rolled out a year from now but at least this gives you a pretty good idea of what it'll look like. And then Appendix K is the sample monitoring tool. So again, we do our compliance monitoring on grantees once they are in place and have begun to implement their grants. And this is the kind of information that would be coming out to your site looking at. And then um, Appendix L is our uh, page of evidence-based resources. So again, I talked a little bit earlier about the fact that we here at the BSCC really encourage the use of evidence-based practices wherever possible. So we're just giving you some resources here that we hope will be helpful as you look towards that. Okay, so Proposal instructions, 
this is just kind of a high level summary of everything that is going to be important as you look at putting together a complete proposal package. So again, I have put it in red here. That proposal checklist to me is just really invaluable as a tool to make sure that you've got all the pieces there and that everything's completed in the way that we're asking for it in the RFP. So please be sure to rely upon that. And then the applicant information form, um, again, that's part of the, the proposal package that's in at the very end of the RFP. And that's a critical form. It's really important that we receive that and that it be completed in its entirety, that the request amount match the request amount that's in the budget and that's it in any of the narrative that you've provided. Um, and that it have the appropriate signatures. And then the proposal narrative. Again, this is gonna be the bulk of your proposal. This is where you're gonna lay out your, your project need as well as the description and the evaluation or data collection pieces. Um, so very important that that be completed and, um, and that it tie to the other components. And one of those other components, of course, is the budget table and narrative. <coughs> and again, that is the Excel document that is uh, separate from your, your narrative, prop your proposal narrative. And, um, but very important that those two tie together in a way that's easy to see. And then finally, I just added on here again, the disqualification instructions. Um, please be sure to look through that and ensure that you are not um, forgetting any of the pieces that could cause disqualification. All right, so then looking at the key dates for this grant. We have already got the RFP in the field that was released on November 14th. And then again, we have uh, the letters of intent that we're asking for by December 20th, but if you can't hit that date, please just get them in as soon as you can. And then the proposals are due on February 21st of next year. And then once they come in, during the months of March, April, and May, we'll be working with the ESC members to provide some training for them on how the proposal rating will be conducted, and then they will have time to do all the reading and rating on their own, and then we'll bring them all back together again so that they can meet and develop their final funding recommendation. And then our, our goal at this point is to take those funding recommendations to our board at its meeting on June 11th um, with the anticipation of starting new grants on July 1st of next year. Assuming we hit all those dates, we would be looking at holding that uh, mandatory grantee orientation session somewhere around September or October of next year with the specific date and location and all that to be determined once we actually have grantees identified. All right, so that brings us to the end of our prepared presentation. Are there any questions?
No questions? Okay. All right. Well, then, I'm just going to do a really quick summary here. So again, proposals are due February 21st, 2020. Those proposals should be submitted to the grant mailbox, which is tribal youth diversion at bscc.ca.gov. Um, to the extent that you have questions, we will be responding to them through the proposal due date and we'll update the Q&A um, FAQs that are posted on our website as needed to reflect questions as they come in. Um, one final reminder to use the checklist and the disqualification instructions. And um, I want to add to that that when you submit your application, um, please note that we are looking for two separate documents with each submission. So one would be the Excel document that is the budget narrative and the budget tables, um, like Isabel showed us. And then the second document would be everything else. So your proposal narratives, those required um, forms and certifications and the checklist and applicant information form, all that other stuff can be PDF'd into one document, but we do need the budget on its own in an Excel version. And that's all we have. Thank you again for making the drive and being here with us. Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, this was very instructive. Was it helpful? Good. It was very helpful. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Okay.